Bill Heath here tonight with us. Uh, he's been in office since 2005. So he's uh, up for re-election. We have a challenger, Bill Carruth, former chairman of the Paulding County Board of Commissioners. And Jason Rogers currently works for the Cobb County Solicitor's Office. Thank you. So if you would like to welcome all our candidates. The rules of the debate. Each candidate will have three minutes to make an opening statement. Order will be determined, determined by a lottery draw of numbers. The candidate drawing number one will go first and each succeeding drawn by candidate to follow. Candidates will have two minutes to answer the question and one minute if the moderator allows a rebuttal or follow up to the candidate's answer. The questions were compiled by the Women's Falling County Public, I can't say it. Paul, it's hot in here, isn't it? Falling County Republican Women's Club. So we put them and we compiled them and we put them in the bowl and nobody has seen them but us. Well, Lydia and I can put that. So we'll go ahead and we'll draw them. Good to be back here. Uh, this is familiar territory for me. I live over uh, just a few miles away over in West Cobb, and I am here all the time. Uh, but you folks are fortunate because when I'm here at the Chamber of Commerce, uh, my wife and I have a tandem, and usually I'm wearing these little tiny black shorts. Um, I look better in the suit. Okay, how we're going to do this? Uh, uh, each candidate has a three-minute opening. Oh my goodness. Uh, and somebody bumped against the light there. Oops, there we go. All right, we got a little mystery. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. All right, uh, we'll have each, each candidate have, has a three minute opener. We will uh, go in reverse order on the close. Uh, I intend to draw two questions from the fishbowl here, and we'll go through through those those topics. Uh, then we have a little uh, a bit of spice to throw in there. Each candidate will be allowed to ask one question of his opponents, and we will go in the reverse order there as well. Mr. Rogers, you will be first. Mr. Heath, you're stuck with second again, and Mr. Carruth, you're third. Uh, and then uh, we'll keep going with questions until we've run out. Uh, we have timers right here who will give you what uh, 30 second a 30 second warning 30 second warning and a and and when you see the red stop they have tasers <laughs> okay all right uh, mr. Bill Carruth let's start with you three minutes good evening and uh, I want to thank the following guy Republican women's club for putting this event together, Jim Galloway, our moderator, and all of you for attending. Let me tell you a little bit about who I am, what I believe, and why I want to be your next state senator. My wife, Laura, and I, both lifelong residents of Paulding County, were married nearly 28 years ago at the First United Methodist Church of Dallas, Georgia, the same church we still attend today. We have three wonderful daughters, there's two of them are sitting right out here, Kristen, Kate, and Caroline, and they have been raised right here in Paulding County also. Um, I am not a career politician. I've spent most of my life owning and operating small businesses, the largest and most recent being Aiken Grading Company, which grew from less than 100 employees to over 300 employees during the 11 and a half years I owned the company. I know how to run a business, create jobs, cut waste, 
be responsive to customers and stay within budget because I've done it. I've also had the honor to serve on the Board of Commissioners as Paul is first Republican chair. My record is clear. I've cut taxes, improved infrastructure, reduced waste, created jobs, and brought a business-like approach to county government. I served on the Georgia Department of Natural Resources Board for nine years and was instrumental in the purchase of over 7,000 acres in Paul and Polk County to be preserved as green space. I'm a social and fiscal conservative. I believe in protecting traditional Christian family values because faith and family are at the core of my value system. I'm pro-life, I'm pro-gun, I'm pro-education. <coughs> my highest priority will be to create jobs, and to do that, we must keep government involvement to a minimum. <coughs> the local boards of commissioners, city councils, and school boards should be making most of your local decisions. We don't need to hand down mandates from state legislators to dictate how things must be done, then leave them to you to figure out how to pay for them. We also can't strangle private businesses with taxes for services we don't need. Government's role in job creation is to do the things that businesses can't do, like educating our children, training our workforce, and providing infrastructure. That's what I did as chairman, and that's what I'll do as your son. I'll create an environment for private business to succeed. My combination of being a successful business owner, serving as a local government chairman, and being on the DNR board give me a unique perspective and the experience I need to be your next senator. I want to take my common sense and sometimes assertive style of conservative leadership to Atlanta to get us on the right, headed in the right direction again. I look forward to talking to you tonight about my plan to improve the district and the state, and I appreciate Thank you, sir. Excellent. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Heath, your turn. Well, good evening. I want to thank the Pauley County Republican women for hosting this event tonight and for inviting me to be here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bill Heath. It's been my great honor to serve you in the state senate for the last eight years. My wife Susan is here with me tonight. We've been married for 30 years and she's the mother of our two children. I hope you'll welcome her as well. It's no big secret that times are tough. It's important that we keep taxes low, continue to cut government spending, and get the economy moving again so our home values will begin to rise again. I believe that it takes conservative leadership, not backslapping politicians, to get our economy moving again. While some talk about being effective, I've been working hard to aggressively cut our taxes and put our conservative values to action at the state capitol. As your state senator, I passed legislation that eliminated the annual car tag tax, protected tax exemptions for our seniors, Increase the deduction for married couples and cut spending so that we could balance the budget every year without raising taxes. Did you know that Georgia has a better credit rating than the federal government? That didn't happen by accident. It's because Governor Dill, myself, and other Republican leaders have been putting our conservative values in action. I'm proud to have helped lead the efforts for comprehensive tax reform and new incentives to get our economy back on track. We have already cre helped create thousands of new jobs in Georgia, and there's more on the way soon. I'm proud to have helped pass the strongest pro-life legislation in decades, and one of the toughest anti-illegal immigration bills in the country. I also voted for legislation requiring welfare recipients to pass a drug test, and zero-based budgeting requiring government bureaucracy to slash wasteful spending. That's not a cheap promise from a wannabe politician. That's a proven record of conservative leadership that you can trust. I'm here tonight to ask for your vote once again with a simple but solemn oath to keep providing the same rock solid conservative leadership that you can trust. And I promise that I will never embarrass you in my personal or professional life. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, 
Thank you to the Pawnee Republicans Women's Club for hosting this forum. Uh, forum. My name is Jason Rogers. My friends call me JK, and I hope you will as well. As a field grade officer in the United States Army and the chief investigator for the prosecutor in Cobb County, I can't always tell my bosses what they want to hear. I have to tell them the truth. And tonight, I've got to tell you the truth. And the truth may be hard to hear. First, let's actually talk about jobs. We have the third worst job loss in the nation. We've lost over 351,000 jobs in the last five years. In the last three years, we have lost double the amount of jobs of any other state in the country. At one point, we had 50 consecutive months of job loss above the national average. Our long-term employed, those that are unemployed for more than 26 weeks, quadrupled from 12% to 51%. Now let's talk about poverty and education. One of the largest cities in our district has a 33% poverty rate. 8% of our people in poverty earn less than $11,127 a year, and that's with a family of four. One of our high schools has a 43% failure rate. We're in the bottom 10% in education across the country. Locally, with real estate, we have 6,000 or more vacant lots just in Paulding County alone. Some say it will take 20 to 30 years to sell those lots, plus the foreclosures. In addition, we have a substantial number of vacant office and commercial space in our downtown areas. Many of our people have lost a substantial amount of equity in their homes and are doubting if they'll ever get it back. With all the bad news, here's the good news. I have a plan that will greatly accelerate fixing this district right now. The plan is simple, and again, it will work right now. What I want you to know is that I will be here for you. At the end of this forum, I will stay as long as needed to hear your input or answer any questions that you have. My name is J.K. Rogers, and I like your support. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, we're going to get to the exciting part down here. Again, I have no idea what's in here. You're not going to embarrass me, are you? No. All right. All right. Uh, we're going to start with, since Mr. Heath, you kind of got on the short end of that, because uh, uh, you're kind of in the middle there. Uh, so we're going to start with you, and then Mr. Ruth, and then Mr. Rogers. Uh, first question, out of the box, do any of you owe any outstanding taxes or debts to the federal or state government? Well, that's an easy one. I'm glad whoever submitted that question did that. I have uh, never been late on any of my taxes. I do not owe any uh, government entity any money whatsoever. I've never been late on my taxes. I've never defaulted on any loans. And I've always uh, ful fulfilled my commitments. Thank you. Mr. Cruz. I can say it without saying all the things he said, but no. I don't owe the federal government, county government, state government, anybody, any taxes, and I've always fulfilled mine, and I've always continued to. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rogers. Uh, the, the short answer is no. Uh, I always get refunds. Uh, unfortunately, that means uh, maybe I didn't make as much money as I should have, but no, the answer is no. Thank you. Uh, these gentlemen are answering way too short. You ladies may have to gin up some more questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, question number two here. Start with you, Mr. Rogers. Do you favor drug testing for people collecting unemployment benefits and welfare benefits? Now, the legislature passed one on welfare benefits this year but I don't think they passed one on unemployment benefits. So if you could kind of uh, uh, go after that one. You first, Mr. Rogers. Well, certainly uh, a lot of people are unemployed and, and that's, a, that's a tragedy. Um, obviously we don't want to embarrass them. Uh, with that said, if they're gonna take our money, then they need to prove that they're out there doing their best to get work and part of that is to be uh, clean. So I would support that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Krupp? 
Absolutely. The people that work at the companies uh, that pay their salaries are subjected to drug tests mm -hmm. as as they are, and, and I think that's fine that they are. I think the people that they're providing the funds for, the tax money for, that goes to the unemployment should at a minimum be required to do the same. Thank you. Mr. Heath. There may be some issues with the federal government about drug testing everyone, but as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to get a government benefit, you ought to be able to pass a drug test. Wait, wait, uh, wait, just if you could expand on that a little bit. What, what, what kind of impediment? <laughs> <laughs> this is informational. The, the, the news reporter is coming out and, uh, <laughs> and our moderator. Um, there are certain benefits, I believe. Unemployment is probably one of those that the federal government says that you can't you can't test for. There have been some challenges to that, uh, constitutional challenges mm -hmm. to drug testing, and, and uh, um, you know we'll, we'll we'll have to work to make progress in that. But there, the, it's the federal government that, that gets in our way with that. I don't think so. So it's government. not your fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we are going into our fun session. Uh, where we're going to allow each candidate to ask one question to each of his opponents. Uh, Mr. Rogers, you're first. All right. uh, questions need to be short. Oh, well, have uh, one minute for questions. Okay, I, I, do I ask one of each or just one? You, uh, you can ask one of each. Okay. Um, I'm Mr. Crew. Um, since we put so many eggs in one basket, as far as with the construction industry and the building industry, um, how would you dig us out of this hole? And do you think it was right to put all of our eggs into one industry the way we did? I, don't, I think in hindsight, I don't think anybody believed it was right to put all of our eggs in one basket. Uh, I don't think anybody saw this coming. Uh, and, <laughs> Of course, we should have been more diversified. The way I, the way I would dig it out is uh, to do things that are pro-jobs. Uh, we need to elim eliminate the state income tax. Uh, we need to reduce unnecessary regulations. Uh, we need to promote a pro-business environment. Uh, we, all, we need to offer uh, competitive incentives to businesses who are moving here with other states. Uh, Florida, Tennessee have both eliminated the income tax. Senator He says they've, they've had sweeping legislation. They did pass a small tax cut, uh, mm -hmm. if you want to look at it that way. But what we need to do is we need to eliminate the state sales tax. That's the number one thing we can do to create jobs. I'm sorry, you, you said state sales tax? I'm sorry, state income tax. Okay. State income tax. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Question number two for you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Heath, um, when you talk about cutting taxes, do you consider fees the same as taxes or, because uh, a lot of things, that a lot of fees went up, but taxes went down. How, how would you answer that as far as the expenses go? Well, clearly fees and taxes are, are two separate entities. Uh, we did have a fee bill a few years ago that, that raised fees on, on a number of licenses. And um, I, I will tell you that when we talk about fees and taxes, I believe it is wrong to expect you all as working people, as working citizens, to pay more in taxes in order to subsidize a license or a fee, uh, a fee for, for generally it's for licenses. Uh, so I think that the, the fees associated with licenses should be commensurate with the cost of, of, of implementing and, and maintaining that database. Uh, it should be no more than that. And, and we have worked uh, in the General Assembly to create a committee to look at those uh, fees and to evaluate them to be sure that, that we're not collecting more in fees than, uh, than what it costs to administer, administer them. If you could stay right up there, because you've got the next questions coming. Well, I, I can make this easy. I, I will, uh, I'll pass on my my questions. <laughs> Ladies, more questions. More questions. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Crew, your questions for your opponents. Um, my 
question, I guess, for Senator Heath. Senator Heath, you voted for the T splash. I don't know if there's going to be a question about T splash, but you, you voted for the t put the T splash on the ballot. I think you said you're opposed to the T splash. If you're opposed to it, why did you put it on the ballot? I'm glad you asked that question. Um, what I hear all across the state is that people want to have the opportunity to make some decisions. Now, I believe that the people of this state and of this district are smart enough to make decisions about whether or not they want to pay more in taxes. If you believe that the Peace Plus offers something greater in value than what, what you will pay for it, you get an opportunity to vote yes. If you don't believe that, you get an opportunity to vote no. I don't think that you should be holding me, uh, uh, trying to uh, pull me down by saying to giving the people an opportunity to vote on something is, is a problem. So uh, I voted for it. I, I, I worked very hard to, uh, to get the, the program in the best shape that I could, but uh, I do plan to vote no. It'll be the largest tax increase in the state of, in the history of Georgia. It will more than wipe out all the tax cuts that we've been able to enact in the last 10 years that I've been in the General Assembly. But if that's what you want to do, I'll pay my share. Uh, 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 yeah, you get a second question, but before you do, before you go up there, just uh, Mr. Groove and Mr. Rogers, uh, how are you going to vote on the T-spot since we've got that issue out there? I'm going to vote no. If I'd, I'd like to have an opportunity to explain that if I, if I can. Uh, perfect. Can I do that? Uh, take a minute. Take a minute. Well, Mr. Rogers, you first. Are you, are you, are you going to vote? You, you got one more question, right? Well, if, if, if you've got a follow up question, yeah, okay. you allow me uh, to, to the team follow question. Oh. Ah, okay. So it's not a question. Okay, we got. Come back here. Come back here. Uh, I'm sorry. A little disorganized. So, if I understand you, Mr. Heath, you, you believe that people should be able to vote on it. That's, that's, that was your answer. And I guess my follow-up question is, you want to let the people decide about T-Splash, but you didn't want to let people decide about Sunday Safer. Can you explain why one is different from the other? Oh, uh, that's, now see, now you're going, you're, 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 yeah, uh, I think we've, you had a rebuttal. I think I'm going to have, have to call a question on that. We can, you can, we can, we can get to that later on, I think. Okay, okay but you got one more question for Mr. Rogers if you want it. because I think people need to make those kinds of decisions. Uh, but secondly, the biggest concern that I have with the T-SPLOS, and I would vote no, and the biggest reason is, is because it will never work if each county and multiple cities in each county don't agree with one another. You can't, you can't have uh, highways that go through different counties and everybody's doing something different. So for it to be successful, everybody's got to work together. If they're not going to work together, I feel like we're just wasting money. Thank you. Let me uh, just unwind here. We're going to see if we can get this a little bit more comfortable here. I'm just going to walk around here. So we just don't have to. Okay. Uh, question number three here from the ladies. Georgia's motto is wisdom, justice, and moderation. How would you reflect that in the legislature? Pass the mic from this side to the other. <clears throat> well, I think I would always be uh, try to be wise and, and informed in the decisions that I make in the legislature. Uh, I think I would always try to do what is constitutional as far as the justice aspects of that question. And uh, I believe in everything in moderation. Uh, I don't think you can go. Uh, Gunslinging and uh, fast and loose, and uh, but I don't think you can sit back and be passive and get a lot of confidence. So I think uh, moderation is uh, 
is a good policy. Mr. Heath. Uh, I don't know what the gunslinging comment was about. I just want you to know I've gotten a, uh, the highest NRA rating every every time that I've been evaluated by the NRA. So I don't really have a problem with gunslinging, but I believe wisdom is is uh, something that you gain with experience. Education is something that you get uh, with, uh, with with the educational process, going to going to our schools, our colleges. I did complete my college degree. Um, we need to exercise moderation in, in everything that we do. Uh, the legislature especially needs to exercise moderation. And, and I believe that that's what we have done uh, as, re as Republicans in this state is we have been very moderate with the work that we've done. And of course, justice refers to, uh, to the judicial system. And, and I believe that we have the best justice system of justice in, in the world. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Well, I, I think you've heard that we're 50th out of 50 states in ethics. And of course, that, that just tells you that we're at the bottom. So I don't know if you're aware, my campaign only accepts $1 donations. Uh, that's the maximum. And the reason why is your story should be just as important as your story. Your story should be just as important as your story. So you don't need to donate $2,500 to my campaign. You give me $1 and that's all we're gonna take. So that, that's number one thing, that's number one. Ethics is extremely important. It builds credibility in our leaders. Secondly, uh, moderation. Obviously, we need to continue to live within our means, uh, but we need to work together. Part of that is get the community back involved. Churches, nonprofits, uh, all these agencies, you know, neighborhoods. You know, back in the day, we used to know our neighbors, and, and we don't do that now. So I would encourage people to get back in touch with people that they know, get the nonprofits uh, back involved, as far as justice, uh, that's kind of hard for me to say because I'm a chief investigator in a law enforcement agency, so you, you're kind of tugging on my heart. But uh, I want to see the Georgia Bureau of Investigation strong again. And, and they're struggling. Their budget has been decimated. They have laid off some unbelievable people. The Georgia State Patrol, um, they have lower numbers than they've had in a long, long time. And to go to the Capitol, and see a state trooper walking people to and from lunch so that they can cross the street is not what a state trooper should be doing. So as far as justice, I think we gotta put more emphasis on public safety because that's what really government is one of the biggest charges that we have. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna come back to law enforcement as a topic, but not, what, since we're, we're, you raised the topic of ethics, uh, we've, we've uh, got a, a coalition of groups out there right now that are demanding uh, that state lawmakers uh, pledge themselves to a $100 gift cap, uh, uh, a cap on gifts from lobbyists to uh, lawmakers. Uh, I'd like to hear from each one of you on whether you think that approach would work and uh, whether you're willing to go along with it. Uh, uh, Mr. Krug, you first. First one. Yes. First of all, I have signed that pledge, but I'll take it one step further. I don't, I, I, I'll make a commitment. I won't take any perks, any theater tickets, any ball game tickets, any any dinners, any hunting trips. I won't take anything from a lobbyist or pay in the state senate. Mr. Heath? I learned a long time ago you need to be very careful about signing pledges. Oftentimes, a pledge that you sign in, in, in good intentions, gets turned around, and then someone wants to interpret it and, and use that to, to direct your ability to legislate. Um, I don't think that uh, uh, we can pass a law and make good folks out of bad people. If, if we had done that, nobody would be murdered today because it's illegal to murder. Now, I will support actively any effective le ethics legislation. But I will tell you that the hands, the, 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 the decision on good ethics lies in each of your hands. When you elect good, honest people to office, you don't have to have laws to tell them how to behave. Mr. Rogers. Well, first of all, I'm not sitting up here with two people that don't know how to work. Um, I th all three of us work. I have a job. That means I earn money. I don't need any gifts. Um, I, I'm doing just fine, I'm, I'm pretty happy uh, working hard. 
So uh, I don't need uh, I don't need free free meals. A uh, hundred dollars, you know. Me personally, I wouldn't need a hundred dollars. So um, I would like to see it even go away to a lower amount. I don't. The people that are serving should be serving for the people. They should not be serving to get a wild hog dinner. They should not be serving to go to dinner at night. They should not be serving for any other reason other than to help our people out, especially during times like this when our unemployment rate is so so bad and people are suffering and our poverty rate is so high. So to me, I think $100 is even too much. So thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Another question here from the fishbowl. <laughs> Okay, this one this should be fairly easy here. Yeah? Uh, HB 386 passed this year. This is the tax reform bill. Uh, do you think it will benefit the citizens of Georgia? And would you have voted for or against it? Uh, I think we'll have to adjust the question for Mr. Heath. We'll let you start because you can explain it a little bit. <laughs> I, I could probably explain more of it than you'd want to hear about. As I co-chaired the, the, the committee that, uh, that that bill came out of. That bill um, not only eliminated the annual Avalorum tax on, on your automobiles for life, for any, any vehicle you buy this year, new or used, um, you, 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 can, you can opt into that system and never pay Avalorum tax uh, again on your automobile. The, the Fiscal Research Center scored that bill and they said that that bill was a $262 million tax cut over the first three years. So um, uh, I forget, <coughs> what was the? 386? 386 was a $262 million tax cut right, yeah. over the first three years. So did, that, did I get your question or did I? I, think, I, think, I, think, you got it. I think you got it there. And, and I, anything that you, any question that you got about my votes, they're all online. You can go look them every one up. You can see every vote. But I voted for it and I worked very hard for it. Pass it to Mr. Rogers, if you will. Well, the concern I have is we, we keep on talking about tax cuts, but I, I'm not quite sure where the ta where, where money is coming to run things. And when they cut the ad valorem, they also made it to where private citizens, when they sell their cars, they now have to pay tax on those cars. In other words, if I sell you a used car, now you have to pay tax. So my experience is if you're going to cut over here, you got to figure out where the money is going to come from because it's got to come from somewhere to pay for things. So I'm not 100% sold on that this was exactly the way to do it. Thank you, Mr. Uh, well, I agree with J.K. about the portion of the bill that deals with used cars. Governor Miller tried that back in the 90s and it was a fiasco. I don't know that anything's been fixed that's going to make it any better. Uh, the bill was a, it was a good bill. Uh, I'll, I'll admit that. Uh, it had some, some good things to uh, it. It lowered the taxes on uh, energy for businesses. Uh, it did away with some of the marriage penalty. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure Senator Heath can explain it. Uh, but, but it doesn't go anywhere close to far enough. Uh, if if Florida and Tennessee can eliminate the state sales tax, there's no reason in the world, I'm sorry, state income tax, there's no reason in the world Georgia can't eliminate it also. And although it was a, a, a to answer the question, had I been in the Senate, I would have probably, I would have voted for it. I would have voted for it. But uh, I don't think it goes near far enough, and we need, we need to work toward eliminating the state. Mr. Heath, uh, Mr. Krug, you your name. You've got a minute coming to you if you want to on that. Well, what I find interesting about the comments from uh, two gentlemen sitting to either side of me is they talk about, uh, want to talk about tax cuts, but they also want to talk about replacing that money. Now, if you're going to talk about tax cuts, you got to be ready to talk about cut and spending. Over the last few years, the Georgia legislature <coughs> cut about four billion dollars off of a 22 billion dollar budget we made it through this recession without raising taxes on you folks we did that by cutting spending so we, just keep in mind when you talk about tax cuts you got the, the other side of that because georgia has a balanced budget amendment a balanced budget 
a constitutional requirement to balance the budget. We can't spend money that we don't have coming in. So when we cut taxation, we have to cut spending right along with it, and we've done it. Thank you, sir. Can I answer? Sure, absolutely. One minute. And I'm all for cut taxes. I, th I think that's the right thing to do. But but I also got to ask you, where are the job gains? We we're double. We have twice as many job losses as any other state in the country, any other state. We have, it would take a half a million jobs just to get us back to where we were five years ago. So again, I mean, I'm, I'm for tax cuts, but there has to be an end result and a balance. And when we are losing 351,000 jobs in one term, I think that is, um, that, that raises some questions. Okay, well, looks like we're gonna keep going on this one. <laughs> well, I, I certainly uh, won't understand that. What I want to do is, is eliminate the income tax and find the revenue somewhere else. Get the revenue somewhere besides from the wage earners and the people that provide the jobs. We need to move toward a fair tax, a more of a consumption tax, so that spread more among everybody and not just wage earners and job providers and uh, the general assembly passed this year a zero based budgeting bill you're going to do it one time every 10 years so we're going to do it right 10 percent of the time now what kind of sense does that make well why don't we do it right every year i mean if we're going to do have zero based budgeting let's do zero based budgeting every year not every 10 years uh those are some of the things that i find somewhat hard to understand so we talk about how important education is. Education accounts for 60% of the state budget. The income tax accounts for about half of our revenue. Now I'm not sure how Mr. Carruth would, would do this if he was able to set all the policy himself. But he wants to talk about eliminating income tax, which I love. I am a firm believer in a consumption tax. I believe you tax something, you get less of it. You don't tax it, you get more of it. I believe we ought to reward folks for being wage earners. But we have to balance a budget. It's easy to sit around on the outside and be critical of the ones who's making the decisions, but we have to balance a budget and we have worked hard to protect the funding for education. Through this downturn, we, we, we did have finally have to make some cuts, but we, Georgia spends more on educating kids than any state that joins, joins us. Um, so we, we have got to, uh, you, you know, you, you just need to think about tax policy. I believe tax policy needs to be broad. I believe it needs to be fair. And I believe it needs to be simple. And I believe it needs to be flat. And, uh, and, and I will and have worked for that. Thank you, sir. Okay, let's, let's, let's change gears just slightly. Uh, now I know uh, Paulding County has a pretty darn good school system. My daughter was a student teacher here. She helped <laughs> over at Hiram, Hiram High. Uh, uh, <clears throat> gentlemen, if, if each of you could tell me your attitudes toward A, school vouchers, and B, charter school systems, and whether the state should be allowed to insert charter schools in districts that decline them. Uh, that's we've got that issue coming up on the ballot in November. Uh, Mr. Rogers, you go first. Well, like I said earlier, I, I believe in getting everybody involved, uh, getting our uh, nonprofits, churches, uh, the neighborhoods involved. I've not given up yet on our teachers, and I understand the concept behind charter schools, but I also believe that we have not done everything that we can do <coughs> to support the people that are in the classroom. I think there are a lot of different things that we can do. Um, so right now, I would be for making improvements to the system that we have. Thank you. Uh, pass the mic down. It's interesting, like I said before, about the signing a pledge and, and, and the different interpretations. We have a lot of folks like to talk about local control, but they don't want people to have an opportunity to vote on, on something like a charter school amendment. The Constitution says that it's the state's responsibility to educate our kids. 
Now, if it is in fact the state's responsibility to educate our kids, we ought to be able to choose how we educate the kids. I believe that offering a charter school is an alternative that, that has been proven to work. And I voted for that bill to put that on the ballot again to give you all an opportunity. It's your tax dollars. Give you an opportunity to decide whether or not the state, whether it's appropriate for the state to have charter schools. Vouchers, that, I don't know how you get more local control than a voucher. When mom and dad, and even in the cases where mom and dad believe that that student has the ability to make that decision, they get to make a decision of where they're gonna spend those education dollars that are allotted to their child. <coughs> and they get to choose which schools they go to. And folks, if, if you don't believe in, in competition and free enterprise, you may be in the wrong room at a Republican women's uh, <laughs> debate. I believe that you have the, the, the wisdom and the ability to make a decision on, on how to educate your kids, and I respect that, and I will always fight for you to have that opportunity. Well, first of all, for, first and foremost, I support the public school system. Uh, and I think we need to do everything we can to improve public school. And I do support local control. And as far as charter schools, I don't necessarily have a problem with charter schools. In fact, I, I'm in favor of charter schools. As long as the money follows the, the child or the pupil, at the same ratio it follows it in the public school system. Now, what this amendment does in charter schools, this doesn't create the ability to have charter schools. The ability to have charter schools exists now. This bill was, came about because there's a few school systems in the state that would not accept applications, which is unfortunate because when school systems won't accept applications, then that, that's not fair and that's not what the intent <coughs> was by the General Assembly or or the executive branch of the responsible legislation. But you can have charter schools without this amendment. All you have to do is pass the local school system and then be approved by the State Board of Education. All this does is put another layer of government. But now, having said that, I would support it because I'm for charter schools. Uh, but this is not an amendment on whether or not we're going to have charter schools or not. We can still have charter schools if this fails. If this fails, there is some constitutionality questions about it because the funding does not match. It does not require the state to follow the guidelines that it does for public schools. And I don't agree with that part of the bill. All right, thank you. Anybody want to add anything to that? Yeah. I, I, would like, I would like to say one thing. You know, when teachers are having to test 30 to 35 days a year, two state tests, that is taking time away from actual learning. I, and, and you know, again, I'm gonna draw on, on my experience in the military. In the military, we don't ship a problem somewhere else. We don't say, well, this company's not doing very well, so we're gonna send it to this battalion. We change the leadership. We get the right leadership in there. We ask the leader, who do you want to come over here? And they fix the problem. They don't kick the problem down the road and say, well, let's let's try this and let's try that. I understand charter schools. I think it's a good good idea. But my first uh, thing is let's put leaders in place that can motivate people, that can, uh, and let's not kick the problem down the road. I just want to be sure I, I understood what Mr. Rogers was saying. So he was saying to fire the leaders that's in place now that's failing because Georgia is. 49th or 50th in education. So would you clarify to me which leaders that you would propose firing? Well, first of all, I never said firing anybody. And we don't we don't fire people in the military that often. However, when you have a strong leader like General Honore, who I worked for, and who went down to Katrina and saw that situation, we didn't say, gosh, what are we gonna do? We picked a great leader, and he took control of that situation. We did not run, we stood there and we fixed it. When we were in Iraq, he called me to stand up the Operational Warrior Trainer Program because our soldiers were getting killed. So instead of doing what I wanted to do, I went to Washington, D.C. We hired the people that trained the people that protected our soldiers. You get the right leadership in place, you let them do what they need to do, and they will fix things. We've got a discussion going here. Yeah, well, I'm just not sure. My, my question is about which 
fire them, replace them, demote them? What, which leaders were you going to suggest be replaced? Because we elect our school board, we elect our state school superintendent, the school board employs the superintendent, and the superintendent hires principals who hire teachers. And the system doesn't work. Now, you suggested that we replace those who are not getting the job done. I want to know which ones to replace. Well, I mean, without a, I, I understand your military experience, and I thank you for that. Uh, but that wasn't the question. Okay, well, if you're, if you're a principal at a school that had a 43% failure rate, you probably need to go to a different school and we need to bring somebody in there and let that person bring people that they know and trust. General Petraeus brought his own team. He didn't fire people. He said, hey, this is what I wanna do. These are the people that I need. He brought the people in and he solved the situation. You can move somebody and let them see a new plan and a new vision and they can learn from that. That's what I'm saying. General Petraeus didn't run though. He said, this is what we're gonna do. I need these people. These are tools and resources I need. Give them to me and we'll fix it. And that's what happened. All right, just before we drive this, this one into the ground here, what you, if, if I can paraphrase, what you're saying is that the state needs to pay more attention to, to addressing the woes of the public school system proper rather than the, the, the charter schools, uh, than, than rely more on charter schools. I just think we need to stop pushing our problems down the road. And I think when we have a school system, when we have our schools that are in uh, the shape that they're in right now, we ask everybody, okay, what can we do to make this better? We get the business community involved. We get, because when you have a 33% poverty rate, you know the kids aren't gonna show up to school as much as they need to. You know the parents are having issues. So you're not gonna, Bill Cosby cannot teach kids if they're not in school. Bill Cosby cannot fix it when the parents, when the kids can't eat, they're not gonna do well in school. When the parents are strung out on methamphetamines, they're not gonna do well in school. So we've gotta fix those types of problems or the school, the school can't fix it. A teacher can't be a teacher and a cop and a counselor. They have a difficult enough job, especially with increasing class sizes, thank you. All right, Mr. Carruth, we've been ignoring you. Uh, you get the last word on this topic before we move along. I just about lost track of what the subject was. I, I can't hear <laughs> about uh, replacing leaders. And uh, with all due respect, Mr. Heath, and I don't mean this to be personal or anything, but the first leader I'm trying to replace is you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You were concerned about your fishbowl running out. I was just trying to help you out. <laughs> For those of you who don't remember, I, I got into politics by challenging someone. That is a right that we all have. If, it, if you can pay your debts, not owe the government money, you're 25 years of age, you're not a fellow, and you've got $400 you can run for the state senate. So I've had a challenger in every election I've ever been in. This, ain't, this is not the first time I've had a challenger and, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready for the fight, baby. <laughs> All right, from the fishbowl. <laughs> Okay, uh, many surrounding states have no state income. Oh, we're gonna get into this one again. Uh, many surrounding states have no state income tax or are moving toward that. If you are in favor of getting rid of the state personal, personal income tax, what would your re revenue replacement look like? Actually, that gets a little bit more into the topic. Uh, Mr. Carruth, this, is, uh, Carruth, this has been yours. Start. Like I've said before in this debate, uh, this, or this candidate forum, candidate, uh, I think we need to go to more of a consumption-based tax that takes the burden off of the wage earner and the job provider and distributes it among the people who are spending money equally. Before you walk away from that, uh, what would you, I mean, uh, 
13 percent state income tax. Uh, we're already at, in, in most most metro Atlanta. We're up to eight. I haven't done man man man. Uh, <laughs> afraid a lot of the numbers are what they are. I mean, whatever the budget needs to be. I'm satisfied between the General Assembly Executive Branch and all the other people that are there, the Office of uh, uh, the Budget Offices and whatever. They can, you can come up with a number, that's, that's not difficult, but, uh, and, it, I, and I know there has to be, that there's some, there's some, a little bit, there's some problems with having rainy day funds and, and, and it, um, it being a moving target, and, uh, but, but rainy day funds can be set aside and locked in place, and then the balance of the revenue can be uh, determined by whatever percentage it takes to make up the, the budget or what I like to cut the budget. Uh, okay, Mr. Heath, what, what would you replace it with? Well, if I, you would. If I would? Yeah. If or you, if I could? If you could. Okay, well, <laughs> I don't know whether you all have been following this uh, process uh, of, of tax reform, but back in December, I asked for a meeting of the Joint Committee on, on whatever it is, the big long name, but the Joint Committee on Tax Reform. Uh, and we met. The purpose for that meeting was to solicit input from the members on how to, what needed to be included in, in tax reform that, that might not have been in there. I was the only one that brought any ideas to the table. And I believe that I brought three or four ideas to the table to cut, to cut our um, state income tax. Um, I just put them on the table. Uh, one of them, frankly, was what if we raise sales tax by a penny and cut cut uh, cut income tax by the same dollar amount. Um, one of the ideas is is to is to tax groceries. You pay sales tax for all of your local sales tax. You pay on groceries. Most folks didn't know that. Not a soul has ever emailed me and complained about paying sales tax on groceries until we started talking about it. Sales tax on groceries is about the, the fairest tax you can have because everybody eats, everybody will participate. Uh, we looked at uh, the possibility of, of raising taxes on cigarettes. Now, that's picking on a small segment. It violates that policy, of, of that tax policy. But that is a group that we spend a ton of money on providing health care for. Uh, so there are a number of varieties that we per pursued. Um, uh, I, I have I've, I've been all over um, tax reform uh, and, and, and con converting to a to a consumption tax, and I'll continue to work at that. Mr. Rogers. Well, I'm I'm going to cheat just a little bit. Um, I understand the information on the taxes. To me, I can consider that at this at this point, after this amount of time on tax reform, I want to get offensive. And what I mean by offensive is, we have talent in this room. We need to grow the economy. That'll bring in the revenue. We need to, instead of playing defense and talking about how bad things are, we need to get going. We need to get our people the information they need to do great things. There are a lot of smart people here. There are a lot of motivated people here. If you weren't motivated, you wouldn't be here. So I understand the question about state income tax, and, and I agree with that. I don't know where you would get the money from as far as cutting what i'm trying to say is let's take these smart people let's create jobs let's create businesses let's get things moving in the, the opposite direction let's change our mindset of one of despair into hey you know what we can do this we can get it back you know reagan when he changed things in the 80s he said let's build up the military let's let's move forward and right now it feels like to me that we're talking about well, gosh, let's, let's hold things close to the best. Let, let's, let's get our people out there and doing great things. Let that, let's let them live their dreams and create and be innovative. And this group right here and in our district, they can do that. And when we do that, we're going to do the things that we need necessary to improve the school system, to bring in more tax revenue. And it solves a lot of these issues. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, switch topics again here. This, this is my question, I'm not, not, not from the fishbowl here. But uh, uh, Senate District 31 has been redrawn, reconfigured. Uh, Bartow County has been eliminated, am I correct? Mm -hmm. and, and, and Paulding County now makes up 60% of the Senate District, if I'm not, if, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I would, uh, beginning with Mr. Heath, I would like to, to what, how do you view 
the specific economic needs of Paulding County? What, just let people uh, identify them. What do you what do you think is is on their economic priority list? And then uh, <coughs> Mr. Uh, Groot, and then Mr. Rogers. The number one issue on the minds of the people of the 31st Senate District and the people of Paulding County is jobs. That's number one. Now we can talk about a lot of other things that, that we need and talk about a lot of things that'd be nice to have, but the number one issue is jobs. We put our people back to work, everybody's happy. I can't disagree with that. I think jobs is the number one priority. Uh, if you would repeat the question. Well, it would, just give, us your, give us your sense of, of the e economic situation of Paulding <laughs> County and what he needs to prove. I, look, I, and, and if, if Mr. Heath needs to readdress it, but let me cross out. You know, I drive around here a whole lot, and I see a whole lot of abandoned sub suburbs. Uh, I think, Mr. Rogers, you had mentioned 6,000 6, vacant lots. Uh, there are some PVC forests around here. Uh, I mean, is that something that, that you can address from a Senate seat? I'm not sure you can. I think uh, the private sector has to, it has to play out. Uh, as long as you can build a house or you can buy a house, or way less than what you can build a house, uh, then the housing, the housing the inventory and the lot inventory is not going to go down, except for what customized houses that are built. I mean, that's the only houses that are going to sell. And that's what we've got to do is get our property values back up, uh, and that's starting to turn. Uh, and, but we've got to try to focus on bringing commercial growth. We've got a hospital, we've got a studio, we've got an airport. We've got a reservoir that I started in 1999 that we're still trying to get permitted, but we haven't been able to do the, the lengthy regulations, but we think we're close to a permit. If we get those things moving, then we'll, we'll start to pick up some uh, some different type uh, of industry. Uh, and I think we're aggressively working toward that. And I applaud the people uh, of the county, the board of commissioners, uh, and then people with the economic development <coughs> and uh, the industrial bill authority for, uh, for the hard work that they do. Ms. Rogers. Can a state senator affect this? Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you see me in shorts and blue jeans, but uh, I jump into the fire and let's hit, let's hit the ground running. I'll be right in the middle of everybody and I'll be pushing this county along with the district. Look, we have 6,000 lives. We can, we can say, okay, it's gonna be 20 or 30 years for this thing to turn around. Or we can say, okay, we have 312 million people in the country. Do you guys want a great deal on uh, a property? Do you want a great deal on a house? Do you want a $120,000 house for $40,000 at 2% interest? Well, we've got one. You want to pay 300 bucks a month? we got one. Do you want a $20,000 uh, lot for 1800 bucks? We've got one. Or you can put it in the bank, get one-tenth of a percent on your interest. I want to get information out to everybody so that they see us in a great place to buy property and to do business. And the first thing you gotta do is you gotta get them here. And in addition, a lot of people in this room, if they knew what the price of real estate was selling for, they'd buy it. But when they drive up and down the street, they don't know that the property is only $5,000. They remember it being 50,000. So if they only knew that it was $5,000, they might well buy it. And, and that's what we've gotta do. We've gotta get information to these people. This is what's out there. This is how we can do stuff. This is link people up with people that can help them out. So, yes, we can fix this immediately. When I say we can fix it right now, you don't just have to elect me. We don't have to wait six months. We don't have to wait a year. We can do this tonight. We, the state of Georgia has a, uh, uh, a cooperative with Google, free websites. We can do that right now. We get the web, uh, information out about our community, and that's what we need to do. Thank you. All right, back to the fishbowl. Um, and this, I, I, I'm not sure that this is going to work here. Uh, would you have voted for HB 87? This is the Illegal Immigration Reform and Enforcement Act of two, 2011. Why or why not? I'm going to assume that everyone, Mr. Heath did vote for it and that these, these two people would vote for it. Uh, let's, let's turn to just push the question a little bit. In terms of, of, of legislation about and concerning illegal immigration, where do we go next? Uh, Mr. Rogers. Well, I think that's a very interesting question because because the budgets are so uh, banged up locally, you've got to have the money to actually implement a policy. Now, as an example, you know, uh, the information that I've got is our farmers lost $400 million in South Georgia. 
the policies that they would have there and the policies that we would have here could be drastically different. And, and I would even argue the three counties that make up this di district have different wants and needs. So I, I think the key thing is to get back involved with the elected leaders and the people of the community, see exactly what those issues are, how they think it should uh, be fixed, and come together and build consensus instead of just, and make sure that we've got the right policy moving forward. Ms. Reed, where do we go next? Well, I have worked on illegal immigration um, not the whole time I've been in the legislature because frankly it didn't didn't really come up in, in the early years. Um, <coughs> illegal immigration is actually a federal issue. Now, it's a long swim, a long swim to the coast of Georgia. That's the only border that Georgia's got that's not with another state. Uh, it is the responsibility of the federal government to enforce our immigration laws. They're not doing it. So what's happening? You all are paying for benefits for those illegal immigrants that are here in Georgia and in this country. Now why are they here? They're here because America offers so much more opportunity than the country that they come from. Most of them risk their lives to get here. There are very few folks who will risk their lives for a job here. We've got to make some big changes in this country. We've got regulations that make it very difficult to employ people. We've got tax policies that make it difficult to employ people. We've got minimum wages. We've got everything stacked against Americans. And when we fix those things, we won't have folks swimming rivers and oceans to get here to take a job. But those folks take the jobs that Americans don't want. Now, you're exactly right. We had crops that wasted in the fields in, in, in South Georgia this past summer. We need a guest worker program that will allow us to bring labor forces in here and let them work in these seasonal jobs that you can't staff up for. And then they need to get, we need to be sure that they're back out of here. And they don't need to just move from Georgia to Alabama to, to, to uh, Mississippi to keep working year round. If you're going to come here, you need to come here and do a job that's not being filled, and then you need to go back home. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cruz. Um, I, would, I, I support House Bill 87. Uh, the immigration bill, I think, it was a good bill. Uh, I know the Agriculture Commissioner uh, did do a study, and, and we did have some crops rotting in the field. Uh, I don't agree with the guest worker plan. I think well, I agree with Governor Deal. I think we need to get these people up out of these prisons and down doing labor and getting these crops up. Not guest workers, illegal immigrants, but get some of these people out of these jails. They're laying around doing nothing on our taxpayer dime, picking the crops that need to be picked. I don't know if anybody's ever thought about why folks are in jail. Most of them's in jail because they're deadbeats. They didn't want to work. If they'd been working, they wouldn't have been in jail. Okay, uh, I promised uh, the ladies of the Baldwin County GOP that I would ask this one question that doesn't come with the fishbowl. But, uh, all right, we've, we've established whether or not you, uh, you folks are in favor of the t and whether you'll vote for it. Uh, but if it should fail on July 31st, uh, what's, what's your vision of Plan B? Mr. Krupp, we'll start with you. I don't have an answer to that question. I don't think anybody up here does. Uh, I think the... the It'll take a, but I'm, I'm willing to work with the other members of the General Assembly, both in the House and the Senate, the executive branch, the DOT board, uh, the people uh, in the in the budget offices, uh, and to try to come up with a way. I do un un understand that we've got to fix transportation that allow to keep our economy going, but there are better ways to fund it than the t -splash. But I don't have the answer to that. Okay, well, let me let me let me push one more question at you uh, on the same on the same topic. Uh, Governor Deal has basically said, he, he has, he has, he has uh, spoken to groups and said, look, this is our effort at giving you local control over transportation. If this fails and we have to go back and have another version, that local control is not likely to be there. Uh, do you agree with that? State that. Well, I mean, it, this, this whole T-SPLOS system has been a kind of a from the ground up right. uh, of, of operation of, of building these, these, these project lists. And what, what 
the governor is saying is that you're not going to see a community center group uh, effort next time. Anything that comes by next time is likely to be top down. Do you agree with that? I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. Uh, I'm not. It, it might be hard to pass. One of the reasons that I, I for the main reason I couldn't support the teeth block is it's a tax. Uh, and, uh, but one of the things that, that really blocked it up for me was I had some transportation experts and some finance experts try to do a formula and look at what kind of return on investment the people of the 31st district would have. Now, you, you know, there's no, it's not a fine science. You can't get the exact answer because you don't know. You, you got to put a value on a road that comes into the county, goes out of the county. But we put, these were, these were very educated people that, that really locked herself in a room. And the best they could do, could come up with in the 31st cent district was 80 to 85 cents on the dollar return on your investment. Um, I don't know that it would completely eliminate counties from having a splash. All the counties had a splash. In fact, I don't think Paul County has ever voted a splash tax down. Now, it's, it's not all about transportation. Some of it's been mixed with fire. Some of it's been mixed with recreation. Uh, but I don't think that would eliminate uh, the possibility of local governments having their own splash. Mr. Heath, what's your vision of Plan B? Well, <clears throat> Part of the problem that we've got is, is, is a lack of oversight on the spending for DOT. DOT's funding comes around the legislature. The legislature has nothing to do with transportation dollars to spend. Once every five years, the legislature gets to elect a DOT board member. There's 13 of them in the state. Most of them are ex-legislators. Uh, we have got to have some serious leadership. Uh, you, Georgia ranks like last in the nation for building new roads. We do very good at maintaining roads. So what that tells me is you can handle a little project pretty well, but you can't handle a big project. We've got to do some, some uh, revamping of, of, of the way the DOT works. Are you, are, you, are you suggesting that, that uh, the General Assembly, that, 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 the trans, that the DOT budget become part of the, just the general budget? Uh, I, I'm not certain that, 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 I don't know that we need to, to have the dollars come into the General Assembly, but maybe we need to have more involvement in the projects and what's got done. So what happened on this peace loss in an effort to get it passed, you put something in there for everybody. You need to go look at the list of projects. There's bike lanes, there's walking lanes, um, uh, you know, there's a huge chunk, not from here, but there's a huge chunk that goes to MARTA. There is a lot of mass transportation in there. There is bus service to Paulding County. The last time I looked, nobody got here on a bus. And how many of you got here on a bicycle tonight? <laughs> there's a bike path right out here. Not a soul rode their bicycle here. So if you want to do something about transportation, you got to quit trying to do something for everybody and get serious about it. Rogers. Well, it, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but it all goes back to we got to get people involved. If the people came to their leaders and they said, look, this is what we got to do. We are sick and tired of traffic. We've got to make this work. And we're tired of you, not, not you, but we're tired of an individual holding something up and getting the special projects that Mr. Heath just talked about. Until Just, just like on any team, football, baseball, anything else, one person is out of sync with everybody else. It messes everything up and for us to be successful everybody's got to row the boat in the same way until we do that i think we're just spinning our wheels as, as far as the governor having to step in obviously that's not the best case scenario um, i think again it's going to be the people in this room getting involved our businesses getting involved the chamber of commerce getting involved and getting with these leaders because i guarantee you any one of the three of us if every one of you were upset by a stance we took we would make an adjustment I, I can't necessarily speak for the other two gentlemen, but if you get involved, things happen. Well, we've already answered a question about the gift tax or the gift cap. So, um, oh, I like this one. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Would you vote to allow casino gambling in Georgia? It's going to be a question on the GOP ballot on the 31st. Uh, Mr. Heath, we'll start with you. And Mr. Cruz, Mr. Rogers. The laws of this nation, and this nation itself, was founded on biblical principles. If you, if you don't understand that, I'd be, be glad to help point you in the right direction on that. But this country is founded on biblical principles. The Bible says you should not gamble. Now, what we've got is we've created this system to fund education. We sugarcoated gambling a few years ago. Zell Miller did that. Uh, we, we implemented a lottery to encourage you all to gamble to fund education. We're going to get something good out of this. Guess who's paying for the education for the rich kids? It's the poor folks. The same thing will happen with casino gambling. Go to any casino you want to, go watch them get off the bus. They got their little oxygen tank, they're hobbling along there, they can't pay their own bills, and they're up there paying, putting money in a, in a one arm bandit. I will always vote against casino gambling. I'll vote against horse racing. And if I was given the chance, I'd vote against the, the, the lottery because I think it's wrong. I have the same feeling as Mr. Heath does, but I, I have a little more practical approach, I think. I'm opposed to gambling. Uh, I think he's, he basically said he's opposed to it regardless of, uh, it, it's, it's a, I guess it's a uh, religious thing with you. Uh, or, or, am I, is that correct? You're answering the question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, I, uh, I would be opposed to it, uh, and I'm, I'm not prejudiced. But if I saw where these Indian reservations were going to be able to bring in for profit gambling because they were, could pass a, the, the test to, to get federal approval and that money was going to be collected anyway and spent to make people wealthy rather than spent on education, or on the things that we could use it for in the state to supplement tax money, then I would try to step in and get ahead of that. Mr. Rogers. Well, two things. Number one, I'm a Christian. Uh, number two, I'm probably one of the most boring people that you'll ever meet. I I'm not out going to gambling places. Uh, I've never gambled. Uh, if I did, I'd probably lose. But. Uh, the, the thing is, and, and I, I totally agree with Mr. Heath as far as I, I don't like it. I don't think it's the right thing to do. But I also have to say there are a lot of things that I don't like. And a lot of other people, um, they do these things. So when I start imposing all of my values and all my beliefs on you, I think I overstep my bounds because you're smart people. You don't need me telling you everything that you need to do or shouldn't do. And so, in, in my opinion, even though I, I'm not for gambling, I think that people should decide those types of things and not necessarily come from the top down, in my opinion. May I? We got a few minutes. <laughs> I just found it interesting. You know, we, we've had these questions about ethics. Mr. Carruth here just said, I agree with everything he said, but if I could cheat the Indians out of making some money, I'd be for it. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> now, what I said is, if I could keep private enterprise, maybe from out of state, from making the profit and let it go into the Georgia coffers where it can be spent on health care, education, transportation, and the things that it needs to be spent on, rather than going into a bunch of people who are using the Indian tribes to, to open up gambling, yes, I would step in as a government and try to try to get that money for the people of Georgia and not allow it to leave and go to the private sector. Absolutely. Uh, you know how I feel about what I just said. You know, the, the thing is, I think when, when you start making decisions based on money, then you start going down the wrong, the wrong path. If, if we make a decision based on, well, it'll bring in $20 million, 
you know, the Hope Scholarship, it brought in a lot of money, but, you know, it's it's losing a lot of money at this point, or it's, it's not bringing in as, as what you see. So, to me, it's, it's a fundamental belief of it's either right or, or it's wrong. In, in this case, I'm not for gambling, but I don't believe it's for me to tell Mr. Heath and Mr. Crew, you can't do this or you can't do that unless it's illegal. And if it's not illegal, then, you know, I don't think I need to be making those decisions for you. All right, here's one. Uh, and uh, Mr. Heath, we'll start with you on this one, so listen carefully. Do you know what Agenda 21 is, also known as sustainable <coughs> growth, and will you work to root out current implementations, in, implementations in our community and vote against any legislation that would mandate its policies? So you want me to answer this question so these other guys will know how to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> opposed to agenda 21 and uh, and I'd be opposed to anything uh, that I think the U.S. government ought to run the U.S. and not the U.N. But tell me what agenda 21 is. Well, it, it's, a, it's a conspiracy uh, theory <laughs> <laughs> that was started back in 1992, if I'm not mistaken, and it, it's the, the U.N. The, the, the UN believes that they should be able to tell everybody how to plan their communities and live and and I don't believe the UN ought to be involved in, in making policy on American soil. I think the United States government needs to be. All right. Mr. Heath, you want to take a crack at that? Let me clarify. It's not a conspiracy. <laughs> This, this, this is the real McCoy. Agenda 21 was adopted by the United Nations. I don't remember the exact year, but it was in the, uh, it was early 90s, late 80s. It's been around for a long time. And their vision is to, is to essentially conquer the world through limiting everything that we do. And, and part, of what, part of what's happening is, as you talk about these sustainable communities and, and and one thing and another after that, it's just incrementally taking our liberties away from us. It is real. It is not a conspiracy. I will tell you that, frankly, the word sustainability is not an evil word, but it has been used in the wrong ways. I believe that every one of you try to live your lives in a sustainable way. You wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't. And that's what the United Nations through Agenda 21 has tried to accomplish is to take these words that sound good and they implement them through through the federal government they're trying to do it through uh, the state government they're doing it through local governments and it is just incrementally taking your rights away from you your liberties away from you and they will succeed if we're not very diligent. Mr. Rogers. Well, I'll be honest with you. I can't speak specifically to Agenda 21. I, I can tell you that I've worked with a lot of different countries uh, when I was in Iraq. Uh, the UN has never seemed to have the ability to do what they intended to do. Um, so I can't speak specifically to Agenda 21, but based on what I'm hearing, it doesn't sound like they're going to... We, we've got it right in this country. We just need to get our feet straight and head back in the right direction. And I don't think we need anybody from outside the country fixing capitalism and the things that we've got going for us in the country. Thank you, gentlemen. Last question before we do our wrap up here. Uh, Governor Nathan Deal signed an order continuing the work of a criminal justice reform council that was instrumental in sweeping changes enacted this past legislative session. Were you in favor of these reforms and are you in favor of more reforms? Uh, basically what this was was uh, 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 an effort to, to Clear our prisons of the the, the nonviolent offenders, and and find a little a little more a few more cost-effective ways of uh, of uh, treating them. Uh, you've got the law enforcement background, so we'll start with you, Mr. Rogers. Okay, that, that's fair. Listen, there were some things that needed to be tweaked. I think uh, some of the things were done done right, but but I got to tell you, just as an example on shoplifting, 
you have to steal five hundred dollars now to get a felony. And so, what do you, what do you think folks are going to do? Do you think they're going to go to Walmart and steal something for you know two hundred when they get something for four hundred? I mean, you don't win by making things easier on people that want to do wrong. Now, is it expensive to put somebody in prison? Yes. I think we need to relook the way we incarcerate people and how we train people more so than we we need to make things like shoplifting easy or the penalties less severe on shoplifting. Now the drugs, there were some certain things with the drugs um, that I think was very good. So it's there's some things I like, some things I don't like, but I don't think you win by making the standards <laughs> softer. I think you win by coming up with better solutions and we don't again we don't kick the problems down the road. We've got to actually solve them. And I think a lot of it goes back to when people don't work some, some of this is when people don't work, um, they're going to lay around, they're going to get in more trouble. And so going back, if we're offensive, we get people working, we, we build our community stronger, I think we're going to do better. Because as an example, 85% um, of the people in prison had a poor or bad relationship with their father. So, I mean, if we know that right in, in the beginning, if we can fix that, <coughs> granted that would take a lot of work, but if we start moving down that road, we're going to be more likely to solve our prison population than just relaxing the standards. Uh, I was trying to remember that bill number. Anyway, the, the criminal justice reform bill is is modeled after a system that was implemented in Texas as has proven to uh, to be a, effective. We, it, the, Texas is making progress in, in that area. The problem is, is we got folks, we lock them up for whatever whatever the reason is that we lock them up. There are many in there that are nonviolent. They are, they're not a threat to society. This is simply punishment for them. To, to make them go spend, whatever, six months in jail, a year in jail. They get no rehabilitation there. They get back out and they do the same thing they did before. And we have paid to the tune of thirty or $40,000 for them to have a nice hotel room to live in for a year. So what this bill was about was, was really looking at how we deal with violators. If you got a parole violation, I mean, it's one thing. You, you, you might discourage somebody from, from parole violations by putting them in jail, but you're not really changing their, their uh, the, the way they operate, the way they think. What you do do is you take them away from being able to earn a living for their family, being with their family, the, the situation that Mr. Rogers just mentioned, having a father in a home is very important. Uh, so that was, that was what this is about, and I am I'm anxious to see, uh, see the results here, and, and I intend to continue to pursue it and, and look for other ways that other states have done things that, that, that are effective. And when, when we know that another state's doing something that's working, uh, we're gonna try to do it. Screw it. I don't like it. I understand why he did it, uh, and I can't criticize it. I think when the, when the economy picks up and Funding level, we may need to, to tweak it back the other way, uh, but I, I don't disagree with him, with what he did. Incidentally, <laughs> <laughs> incidentally, Georgia incarcerates a very high percentage of its population compared to other states. I don't know. I don't believe that we're just a, a, a more evil state. Maybe we don't do things right. Okay, well, anybody else want to intercept? All right. <laughs> Let me just say this. Uh, Mr. Heath just brought up we spent $30,000 to $40,000 per inmate. I, I believe we spent like $900,000 on small business last year. Maybe if we increase our small business spending. Uh, we've got edu uh, education in another county. They, they go to school four days a week, but there's no money for the parks and recreation. I mean, we can spend $30,000 or $40,000 on keeping somebody in a cell, or we can maybe spend a little bit and help our kids uh, and help our small businesses reach the goals that they're looking for. Neither issue is on a straight line. They all interrelate. And that's why I'm saying we've got to get everybody back involved, everybody around the table, everybody talking. Mr. Crook, you want one more, one more dip? Okay, all right, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience tonight. Uh, we're, we're down to our, our closing statements. Uh, gentlemen, it's up to you. Uh, we can pass the mic or, uh, in this exact order, or you can step to the podium. Your choice. Listen, uh... Again, thank 
the line.